Zeitlanders, how are you? I hope that you're well. I hope that is everything is well with you and your families over this festive period. And that you are with the people or going to be getting together with the people that you love and care about. The people for whom we do the work that we do. I think that I speak for most of us when I say that largely we don't do this work for ourselves. It's very hot here in Van der Kloof. I hope that the sound of the fan is not irritating you, but I must have it on. It was 37 degrees Celsius in Van der Kloof today and 38 degrees Celsius yesterday. And with the electricity cuts, you know, it's so much worse because you can't just turn on a fan at the time that you really need it. Fortunately now, uh, the electricity came on about uh, a couple of hours ago. The sun has set. There's a breeze that there wasn't earlier on. And we can put the fan on. This video is about Geloofde Dag. I want to tell you two things. Firstly, I'd like to describe the Geloofde Dag. There was a terrific attendance and Mr. Miller's speech was excellent. Uh, I think that everybody appreciated it. I think that everybody appreciated the strength of leadership that Saitlanders in Mr. Miller is displaying at a time when the allegation could be made that the leadership in South Africa is weak everywhere. Wherever you look, People are either compromising or they are nowhere to be seen, nowhere to be found. <coughs> so it was good to hear a terrific, strong message from Mr. Miller. And for those of you who haven't yet watched the, uh, the recording that Ernst made, please do. It's well worth it. And here's... Here's a stalky that I'd like to follow up with, an anecdote. After the Geloofde Dag, you can make of this what you will. Um, I'm not suggesting that the impression that I got of what happened is necessarily true. Perhaps I'm superstitious. I realize that. But you, like me, may think twice about such a peculiar event. It happened like this. After the Geloofde Dag, or in the evening, uh, four or five hours after Geloofde Dag ended, Mr. Miller's family, and I was invited, uh, and uh, another couple, Yurik, some of you will know Yurik, had a bride. And the conversation was very convivial. And at some point it became quite deep and profound. We were all seated around Mr. Miller's helipad. Uh, it would have been Mr. Miller and his wife, Naomi. His daughter, Elsha, and her husband, Johan van der Poel. Um, his daughter Christine and her husband Isaac, his daughter Cornelia, Jurek and his wife, and myself. I think that was everybody. And we were seated in a horseshoe, horseshoe shaped, uh, an incomplete circle. And uh, Christine, his daughter Christine, was seated in the middle of the circle. Mr. Miller here. I was there, and I'm going to mention another lady in a minute, that's uh, Yurik's wife, Elmin, was over there at the end, at the tip. And as I say, Christine was here. And the conversation, as I say, was convivial, and at some point it became quite deep, very deep, very profound, poignant. 
and people after lots of noise began to speak a little bit more quietly it was a, a moment of solemnity if you like but there had been a hang of a lot of noise kiddies in the background screaming and shouting and performing and carrying on as they do the ladies <laughs> gossiping and laughing and shrieking and squealing at their funny jokes and all of a sudden Christine said isn't that a snake over there I think there's a snake I'm telling the story in English obviously but of course it was largely or almost or completely conducted in Afrikaans and uh, I heard her out of one ear but I didn't pay any attention which in retrospect was stupid oh I should point out that all the dogs about seven or eight of them were lying on the slasto of the helipad under the chairs and there was a large bry with a big lamp above it between us in the middle of this horseshoe a few seconds later Yurek's wife Elmin said quite calmly she kept her nerve there's a snake there's a snake I looked to my right, Elmin was seated on my right, Yurik would have been on her right, on the very tip of this horseshoe, but he had uh, gone inside for a minute. And uh, I saw the snake, and I stood up. I was very proud of myself, cool, calm and collected, a big snake, about uh, 1.65 to 1.7 meters long in the end a heel slum a cape cobra nice and thick too and it slithered right under Elmin's chair and she put her feet up and it then slithered under my chair as I say by which time I'd stood up and I was facing towards the snake, the snake. I'd stood up and turned around and was looking down at the snake slither under my chair it slithered between my two dogs who didn't stir and those of you who know my dogs know that they're alert to put it mildly crazy dogs and eventually with all of the performance of the, the women getting up and moving away my dogs stood up but still completely oblivious as if they were blind the snake between them inches away from their noses it then slithered between one of my dog's legs and I took a step back and I thought that I knew where the snake was but in the in the shadows and the dimness dear me I wonder what that was in the shadows and the dimness I lost sight of the snake and Mr. Miller was behind me we'd been seated more or less opposite one another so when I stood up and turned around to face the snake he came from behind just around the bry and was directly behind me and as he <laughs> as he tells the story he thought that I was very brave little did he know I also thought that I was brave don't worry I thought the situation was well under control <laughs> and he said to me Simon pass up hey gaan jou pak I ignored him because I was still fairly confident that even though I couldn't see the snake it was more or less in a place somewhere in front of me underneath my chair between the dog's legs and then he grabbed me and yanked me out of the way the very same dogs the self same dogs he grabbed me and he yanked me out of the way 
and in doing so possibly saved my life. I didn't know it at the time but the snake was according to Mr. Miller this far give or take I don't know that far from coming straight towards me and from my my shin. I was wearing shorts to make it worse. He pulled me out of the way. The snake kept on going towards him and standing next to him, also having stood up from the other side of the of the horseshoe and now behind my back, well, until I was yanked out of the way. <laughs> and I got such a fright that I, it was like walking on water. You know, I, th I think if I... And the snake kept on coming for him and Johan van der Poel, his son-in-law. They moved aside and the snake kept on going to where they had been, right where they'd been standing. And Mr. Miller picked up a tongs and he smacked the thing. Johan van der Poel then plucked it up by the table the tail, I beg your pardon, and proceeded to give us a, uh, a lesson <laughs> in how, if the snake wasn't dead, by the way, it was, uh, I suppose, a bit injured, it was hit, hit in the back, so slightly disabled, but wriggling like crazy, Johan plucked it up by the tail, held it aloft, he's quite tall, and shook it continuously. While, as I say, giving us all a lecture on how if you shake the, the snake vigorously, it can't exploit its hard point, if that's the correct term, and it can't turn and strike while in the air. To cut a long story short, we eventually killed the blasted thing. And we sat down and we began to speak about it. And Christine's husband, Isak, very, very sternly as we were speculating about this snake and why it would come into light, why it would come inches, inches from a fire, a blazing fire, flames, not coals. We hadn't yet fried the meat. Why it would come to a place where so many people were seated, why it would come into, a, into the vicinity of so much noise on the kids' part. And Isak, as I say, said very sternly, I suppose, repeatedly, Dus di Satan. Dus di Satan. Dus di Satan. In his way. And I have to say that I found myself convinced in the end that there was something uncanny about it. There was something perhaps spiritual, something wicked, something evil something sinister, something menacing, that entered that conclave of people on that holy geloofde dag at a moment in time of great profoundness, at a moment in time of deep and meaningful conversation. I don't know Perhaps I'm superstitious. Perhaps Isaac is superstitious. Perhaps we make too much of it. But it was quite an incredible end to what was a moving, powerful, I'll use the word again, profound and poignant day. And that's the story, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for listening. We hope to see some of you or many of you down here 
in Front of Kluif over the next couple of weeks. Um, oh, by the way, on that note, thank you very much to all of the people who greeted us and chatted with us on Geloofde Dag three days ago. Um, I met some very nice people. To the gentleman from Alberton, it was lovely to speak to you. I'm sorry I didn't get to see you again. Uh, to the others, to everybody else, Peter from Richards Bay. Oh, dear me. But I've got an excuse, Peter. I've already given you one excuse, but I've got another one. It's because your name in my phone is still stored as Peter of Richards Bay. Nevertheless, my apologies, my sincerest apologies. Um, yeah, everybody who came to greet, thank you very much. It was lovely to see you there. And we hope that you thoroughly enjoyed, as we did, a uh, profound occasion. Have a good week. Have a good uh, Christmas if you celebrate Christmas. In any case, have a good time with your family, whether you celebrate or you, you don't celebrate. May God, our God, the God who will look after us in the time that lies ahead of us, Take very good care of you over this festive family period. Thank you for watching and bye-bye.